Um, Rodenschwartz sued, and it, it effectively came down to this one technique. Um, spoofing MNCs, MCCs, network names, it's, it's all trivial, but you know, this, this one technique is the, the, the one that's patented. So I mentioned earlier that we, we don't see inbound calls. We, we only see outbound calls. Effectively, the MZ catcher is a completely isolated cellular network. Um, as far as your carrier is concerned, your phone is off, it has no signal, it's just, it's not there. So of course they're gonna send calls inbound to your voicemail. Where else are they gonna send it? Your phone's off. So the attacker doesn't see the, uh, the, the inbound calls. So the way that we get around this is, obviously if you're connected to my, my tower, um, my tower has to authenticate you, therefore it, it will ask for your MZ and your phone will quite happily supply it. So I know your MZ. What I can then do is I can, you know, go to AT&T and say, hey, here's my MZ. I'm, I'm spoofing this guy over here, but you don't need to know that. This is my MZ. And I know that this guy's not on the network because he's on my network, therefore it's perfectly safe to do this without you seeing two phones. So I, I claim this MZ. The problem with that is that we don't know the secret key in the SIM card. We don't know KI. Um, and what's going to happen is the, the, when I claim that MZ to AT&T or T-Mobile, um, they're going to send me a random number, a 32-bit number, just a, a challenge. And what normally happens is that challenge gets passed to your SIM card, gets encrypted with your secret key, and then split into two parts. Half gets returned to, to the tower as just kind of proof that you know the secret key, and the other half is used as the ciphering key. Well, what I can do to exploit this is I can just pass that random challenge along to your phone. <laughs> Whereupon your phone will happily you know, encrypt your secret key with it and, and all the rest of it and send the result back to me. But the result doesn't come back to me as, you know, here's the, here's the answer. Um, the, 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 the session response I do get just kind of here's the answer, but the, the secret key I have to crack. And, and here's the, the, the great thing about IMSI catchers as opposed to, you know, Kraken and AirProbe and those kind of things. Um, Kraken and AirProbe, how many folks saw that release at Black Hat, the, the A51 Cracker? So the, the big limitation that that thing has is that it doesn't work on frequency hopping base stations, which virtually every base station in the civilized world is. So it, it kind of doesn't have real world applications. Well, in this instance, I'm the base station. I set the hopping sequence. So I can just say to you, okay, let's negotiate A52 because I can break that really easily. And then let's disable hopping so that, you know, I, I don't have to worry about that. And then I can use these rainbow tables to crack your secret key. Whereupon I recover the session key. I now know the session key and the, the session response, which was the authentication response. And I can just reuse it all to the carrier. And as far as the carrier is concerned, okay, it took a few seconds for me to, you know, establish a, a challenge to your handset and then crack it and all the rest of it. But at the end of the day, I provided the right response to the carrier. So, hey, I must be you. It's, it's, it, it's not implemented in this system yet, but it's, it's definitely possible to do. It's, it's the technique that commercial IMSI catchers, IMSI catchers use to catch inbound calls. Certainly, yes, I, I cannot do that in this system currently, but it is absolutely possible with IMSI catchers. So just a little more on breaking that session key. Um, it is the only time um, when you're using an IMSI catcher that any cryptography is needed at all. Um, the majority of the time, I just configure my base station to just negotiate A50. Just disable encryption. What do I care? Um, if I negotiate A52, um, A52 is very, very easy to crack, much easier than A51. So, you know, that gives me a, a very quick way into your handset. Um, alternatively, you may reject A52, regard A51. Well, clearly A51 is, is still, you know, crackable and we can still do that. But in either case, any calls that originate from your phone come to me as plain text. So what's the solution to all of this? You know, how do we, how do we fix this? Um, the reality of it is that there, there is no good solution, um, not in the context of GSM. GSM is broken. It is the telnet of cellular systems. In order to fix GSM, you'd have to redesign GSM. And if you're redesigning GSM, you have to upgrade every handset. You have to change every tower. You have to change the networks that live behind them. So why bother? If you're going to that much effort to redesign everything, why don't you just move to 3G? 
the, the solution here is 3G and, and later protocols. Um, 3G authentication is much better. Obviously, 3.5G, 3.9G, LTE, all of the, the, the subsequent protocols build on that as well. Um, the primary solution here is turn off 2G. Unfortunately, um, how many people have Android phones? Um, you've seen the setting that says use only 2G networks. Yeah, supposedly saves battery. Um, how many people have ever seen a setting in a phone that says use only 3G networks? Okay, BlackBerry has one. Um, certainly Android doesn't, iPhone doesn't. So how can we be secure here? Um, certainly 3G is, is it's showing cracks. It's not been broken broken. The, the, the Kasumi cipher has been somewhat broken, um, but the, the 3G protocol hasn't. Um, so yeah, just use 3G. Look for that icon on your screen with the little 3G. If you see that, then you're, you're pretty good. Um, alternatively, just treat it like a data network. Just you know, layer another, uh, uh, put another layer of crypto on top of it. Um, treat it like voice over IP. Just use it as a data network. Treat it like the internet. Encrypt everything that goes across it. Just, just don't trust it. And then in the long term, the, the, the big solution is to just turn off 2G. Which will happen eventually as you know, three and a half G and four G are, are deployed more widely. Um, hopefully, you know, now that that you know I've demonstrated this, uh, there'll be little argument that you know it, it's totally possible to intercept two G phone calls. Um, so hopefully, we'll it'll spur some uptake of three G, and uh, you know, we'll see where it goes. So, one final demo. Um, let me just see how many Timsies we have connected here. 17. Okay, so people are actually handing back to the normal network. That's unusual. Um, certainly, there was a lot of handsets connected to start out with. Um, it's possible that I actually, you know, mistyped AT and T. That I think there's some spaces in there. So um, it's entirely possible that your handsets are connecting to me and going, "Oh, you're you're not spelling AT and T correctly. I'm I'm I'm, I'm out of here." Um, so either way. Um, Certainly, you know, feel free to, to make some calls through it. Uh, the only limitation is that you have to dial one in front of the number, um, or you know, whatever country code you want. You're only limited by the, the twenty dollars of credit in my SIP account. Um, feel free uh, if you've if you've not heard the recorded message, then you know, like I say, connect to the network and um, you know, have a play. It's 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 there for the next couple of minutes while I take some questions. 